Good morning again, and welcome to Brighter Morning with Bo. We're glad to have you this morning. Our next guest is Mr. Andrew Ramrup. He is a uh, upscale tailor. He was born in Trinidad and Tobago, and he owns a company called Morris Sedwell, known for the finest tailoring and garments in the city of London, England. Uh, and he comes from time to time in Trinidad and Tobago. He's now expanding his business. Google identified his particular business as one of five businesses that they highlighted as a small business that had really built an international reputation. Uh, some weeks ago, they had that floating over the internet. And we have been in touch with him. We've asked him to be a guest here this morning. And we want to talk with him about his particular business. Um, the, do we have him online? So could we show a little bit of what we have of uh, Andrew Ramrup, and we will do that while we get him on the line. Could we show the video of his interview in London when he received an award there for the quality of his work, please? The next stage is the design, as we like to say on Saburo, the style, because our customers cut style. And here is the style that we're going to make our jacket in. Now, for the very, very first time, exclusively to you and all who are doing the mastered course, I'm going to allow you to use my signature style. Here, based with a 24-karat gold stripe on a Super 150s cloth. What is actually different about this style is the lapel details, the pocket details, and the handcraft tailoring, which I will point out to you now. The outside chest pocket is cut in harmony with the shoulder line. The lapel, the width at the top, with a real flower hole, with a loop at the back to accommodate the stem of a flower, should your customer wish to wear a flower, follows down to the button one styling, well balanced when it's unbuttoned, stays together, and then follows through to the side pocket detail, which the pocket line begins below the waistline. So when the pockets at the sides are occupied, it builds the hip up. When the inside pockets are occupied, it builds the chest up. It does not interfere with the waistline. So what we're trying to do is create the optical illusion, if you like, of a small waist. So we do not bulk the waistline. Follows through to the side here. Real buttonholes on the cuffs. Functional. They can all be unbuttoned. You can see here they're all real. We'll be making five button cuffs for our pure cashmere chalk stripe suit. The inside of the garment you see, a touch of fun, expressing a bit of personality here with the fancy lining, but the lining actually coordinates with the blue on the suit. Two inside pockets, what we'll be doing in addition, is giving you a ticket pocket on the left facing for business cards or mobile phone and so on. What you'll also observe is the hand stitches on the edge. We've done that on the seams. We've done it all the way through, also on the side. Okay, so you saw there Andrew Ramru, whom we are trying to get online, but we have a little difficulty uh, with the communication. Um, and he owns a company called Morris Sedwell. You can see the quality of clothes uh, that he is involved in. Um, and recently, he was honored in Britain by the Queen of England. And he has been honored in Trinidad and Tobago as well with uh, national uh, Shaconia Gold Medal. Um, given at independence time some years ago. Uh, so we are going to look at that, 
but I wonder, do you have the television? Do you have the television interview where he talks about Trinidad? Would you have that prepared, please? I will go to Andrew now, and we will talk to him, and make sure we have that television interview so we can have him talking to the British um, uh, interviewer about his memories of Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, Mr. Ramroop. How are you? No Thank sound. you very much for having me on. Yes, um, I will ask them to raise your volume a little bit so we can hear you better. We're very glad to have you on, and we ran a little clip in which we, which we had you showing some of your work, some of your creations at uh, Morris Sedwell. You were sharing that with oh. a British... Uh, journalist uh, so we were doing that so you want to ask you though I mean who is Andrew Ramroop really well Andrew Ramroop is, uh, is is a son of, of wonderful parents uh, my father was Shalin Ramroop and my mother baby Ramroop um, born and grew up in Mengo village uh, in the foothills of the northern range of mountains in Tunapana that's a beautiful area there um, I am a father uh, with a, a wonderful son and uh, a, a wonderful family. Um, that's who I am as a person. Uh, in my profession, uh, very differently, I'm a, a bespoke tailor and I cut and fit and design garments for both men and women throughout the world. I've got a customer base in 60 countries. Yes. How, where did you... How did you develop an interest in your craft and how did you develop your skills? Uh, when did that begin to happen? Could you talk about that? Very interesting question. Certainly. Very interesting question in regard to uh, how I became interested in tailoring. There was a tailor very close by to where we lived. And I had always been interested in uh, hanging around and seeing what he was doing. I've got to tell you that I was a very young age. I was about uh, 11 years old. Uh, but prior to that, my mother reminded me that I used to cut up her pillowcases and try to make trousers, well, pants, you know, loosely resembling pants. And uh, so the, early, the very early beginnings, my mother reminded me I was about nine years old, cutting up pieces of paper, sticking it together, and trying to be creative, perhaps the origami of clothing. And from then on, I wanted to leave school to go on to get a, an apprenticeship, but my parents wouldn't let me, my father particularly, because, you know, the pathway to success, in his view, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, was that academic attainment, going on to school, going on to college, and then perhaps going on to university and, and doing great things, or deciding what to do with your life after university. But... Uh, from a very young age, I wanted to become a tailor, and I persuaded in my mother in her own imitable way, she actually persuaded my father to allow me to leave school and then to go on and seek an apprenticeship. I've got to tell you, I was about, I was 13 going on 14 when I left school, and I sought an apprenticeship, and at age 14, I began to learn to make pants at this very tailor that I used to hang about at, and then I went on to learn to make jackets. Is and, in uh, Tunapuna at the age of 14. Yes. All right, very good. And what hap happened thereafter? Well, after that uh, age 14, I then went on to learn to make jackets at a tailor called Kisun Singh on Frederick Street in Port of Spain. And thereafter, uh, I had heard of Savile Row, where the pinnacle of sartorial excellence is practiced where the captains of industry, prime ministers, presidents, uh, the rich and famous Hollywood stars, that's where they went to have their, have their clothes made. And I thought I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be like the young athlete wanting to be in the Olympics. I wanted to be in the Olympics of tailoring. And so I saved every penny that I possibly could. And saving was very much in my DNA. My father encouraged me to save as much as I possibly can. And I bought a boat ticket, and I like to say I sailed to Savile Row, not so much sailing to England or to Europe, but um, 
and, you know, having left school at a young age, I hadn't done geography, so I, I didn't understand very much about where I was going, except that it is rather like wearing blinkers, you know, uh, and being focused on what I really wanted to do for a career. I went off uh, in uh, July 1970. I sailed to England and I found a job uh, as an apprentice tailor. But I discovered while I was there, if I wanted to get to the front of the shop where this big dream was, that I, I needed to get trained in Savile Row style, Savile Row cutting and fitting and so on. And again, I, I worked extremely hard. I worked at four jobs and I saved as much money as I possibly can to attend the London College of Fashion, the University of the Arts, to do a three-year uh, degree in bespoke tailoring, business studies, uh, art and design, and uh, cutting and fitting garments. And, and did a bit of PE as well and did French uh, so we, we, we did quite a lot, pretty comprehensive uh, training. Yes, okay. So you had a dream, you pursued that dream, you kept that dream in front of you, you did everything that was required to make that dream come true. And eventually you not only became uh, what you might call a, a highly fashion skilled tailor um, and a designer of clothing, men's clothing really, suits and other things, but you eventually bought a store. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, I've got to tell you uh, this little story because, you know, you could think, think this is uh, in the early 70s yes. in London. Yes. It was pretty challenging. I wanted to get to the front of the shop, uh, you know, to meet all these great names that I'd heard about. Yes. Just this fantastic dream that I so had. You, you wanted to be somebody. I wanted, indeed. I wanted to, you know, navigate my way through to, to, to get to where I aspired to. Yes. I had graduated from the London College of Fashion, and if you consider at the London College of Fashion, they start with 10 students in the first year and eight, uh, no, t 15 in the first year and 10 get selected to go on to the second year and then eight get selected to go on to the final year. Now, I was one of the eight in the final year. So you've got lots and lots of high class tailors clamoring to employ you, but no one would employ me. I had 11 appointments and turned out for all of them because I wanted to be at the front of a shop and I didn't look right. I didn't speak right. It, it was nothing right about me to be able to get this job. And this my, it was my early uh, experience of racism. Yes, yeah, so race and, so, and culture worked against you. Very much so. How did you and, triumph you know, had, over that? Well, I would go back to the college and I would say to the principal, I didn't get the job. They'd say I, I wouldn't fit in. And one, one tailoring house uh, manager director said to me, well, you wouldn't fit in at the front because our customers would not take kindly to foreigners. But if you wanted a, a job in the back room, then there's a job here for you. But that wasn't my, my career pathway that I wanted for myself. And so I turned down uh, every opportunity. I got offered to the back rooms, but never at the front. And then Mr. Maurice Sedwell called uh, the college and asked if there were any graduates. And fortunately, all of those persons that turned me down were actually kind of signposting me to someplace else because uh, when Mr. Sedwell gave me this four-week trial, I, I excelled under Maurice Sedwell. When, you, when you went to see Maurice Sedwell, did you, mm -hmm. uh, was that a point at which prejudice did not matter anymore? Did he just accept well, you that, as you were? Well, by that time, Maurice Sedwell, I've got to tell you a little about him. He had been in the Navy and during the war, he had traveled the world. He was more open-minded and a lot of the closed-minded tailoring houses on Savile Row and the city and the West End and so on. So he, being open to other cultures, he was more receptive to having someone of another that culture join his break. Yes. Absolutely, yes. And that is the break I was waiting for because he then, there, I got the opportunity to excel at my skills and uh, I've got to say that Mr. Sedwell recognized 
that there was something more to what I was offering than just being another employee. And he pushed me along, he gave me opportunities. Okay. And when I wanted to, I, then I, by that time, I was teaching three days a week, three evenings a week at a London College of Fashion. And college uh, offered me a full-time teaching position. And I went to Mr. Serwell and I said, you know, I've got a full-time teaching position. I told him what the package was and it was very attractive. And he equaled the package and said, if anyone should leave, it should be everyone else, but not you. <laughs> and if you. And if you can raise the money to buy the business, then, you know, it's yours. And that's what I did. And as I said, saving was very much in my DNA. I've been working three times, three evenings a week, teaching in London College of Fashion. I, I was picking up a few customers along the way, I was doing working at weekends. I had a Saturday job and then during the week working at Maurice Sedwell. So I was saving as much as I possibly can. And so with my savings and uh, a, a small loan, I was able to buy 90% of the company. So you actually purchased Maurice Sedwell. You I did, kept, 14 years. You kept the name in recognition of this person who had basically helped you and gave you a, a, a stepping stone uh, to ownership and success. And you have that was seen, very important to me. Yes, and you have now, you are now the owner of that store. You have customers in, you said, 60 countries. And I noticed that now you are expanding in the United States and North America. Talk to me about that. Well, actually, it's very interesting. When I bought the company in 1988, more than 30 years ago, I started to expand abroad. We weren't an export business, perhaps about three, two or three percent export. And my intention then was to develop a brand that was synonymous with quality and service and to make it an international brand uh, of luxury in menswear. And so I wrote to a number of people abroad, offering them my services and inviting myself uh, to come to their countries. And one of those uh, was the United States of America. And I'll tell you, you know, I first started traveling out to the United States in 1991 and developed a pretty strong business there. 30% of my suit making business comes from the United States and 70% of my suit making business is from all over the world. Just 30% in the UK. I'm based in the UK, but most of our business comes from abroad. And so I've developed the, the US business handsomely throughout the East Coast and a little bit in, in uh, the West Coast, but mainly in the East Coast. So, you know, next week, uh, Tuesday night, I leave here to go to New York, Houston, and Washington DC, and then back to London. Okay. Um, would you would you like to say, and you don't have to say if you don't want to, who was the person or persons who might have given you the entry into the U.S. fashion industry? Well, there was there was no uh, individual. What I've done is I've uh, did my research on who are the high net worth individuals that I could reach out to, and I wrote them. I wrote to them and said I was coming uh, to the U.S. I was coming to, to New York, and uh, this is the service that I'm offering. I, I wrote a, a really nice letter and inviting myself. Okay. And I came back in 1991 with approximately, in, in Trinidad money, $730,000 worth of business, 73,000 pounds. It was amazing. It was almost like being unemployed and suddenly getting a job because to come back in that year with three quarters of a million TT dollars worth of business in 1991. It was phenomenal. I what was the, very interesting. Yeah, I get the impression that there is a certain boldness in your personality which allows you to make these breakthroughs. Is that true? I mean, I would say entre entrepreneurship is one thing, but boldness is another. And boldness does not have to be negative. It just has to be based on perhaps self-confidence and a willingness to assert oneself and basically to offer your sense of your own value to others, 
Would you say that you have that? I would say, I would use the word confidence. I had yeah. confidence in my ability uh, to execute the standards that are, was equal or, or even better than many other tailors. You never and had a problem in your head about race, right? It had other, always been a other, challenge. Other people had, but you didn't have. No, I was just, as I said earlier on, blinkered. I was focused very much on delivering excellence to my customers and prospective customers. Yes. And you, you saw yourself as heading somewhere and you wouldn't let nothing stand in your way. Now, you Absolutely. are a person who have re received honors for the work that you've done and the quality of impact that you have made in the world of fashion. And I want to show some photos of that, both in Trinidad and Tobago and in London, where you live uh, most of the time. Um, I, uh, but I want you to talk a little bit about London Fashion Week uh, and mm -hmm. what it means in London and what that is and how you became London involved. Week, yeah, London, London Fashion Week men's is actually promoting the virtues of high class craftsmanship in, in London. Having been uh, the face of uh, Britain is Great campaign. It is, I was chosen, um, uh, there was a lot of research and, and me and my business was chosen to promote London Fashion Week and business in the United Kingdom. And so for, uh, for a whole year, you would see my face on 10,000 locations uh, on billboards and television advertisements and so on. And, and what I was doing- And persistently every year because London Fashion Week happens every year. It happens, it happens twice a year. It happens early in, in the spring and it happens also in the autumn. And the objective here is to, to focus London, particularly not the UK, uh, not England, but London, in, uh, as being the center of excellence in the field of fashion and design. Uh, because the, the world is getting smaller and smaller, online shopping and so on. So the pendulum has swung a lot from physical fashion events to virtual fashion events. Yes. And now, the, the, the focus has been so that we can continue to think of new ways of making London attractive. Okay. Um, uh, what, let me show some of those photos now. Uh, could we have the one in which he's receiving uh, the national award in Trinidad and Tobago, please? This was uh, way back in 2005. Yes, you received the Shekonia Gold in that year, is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes I did. No, you have the wrong thing. Well, let's work with that picture. All right, this is the one with the Shekonia Gold. Here you are with uh, His Excellency, the late uh, Professor Max Richards, and then Prime Minister, and, and his wife, um, Mrs. Richards, and we have Prime Minister next to him and a number of officials. And you, here you are receiving the Shekonia Gold Medal. Okay, let us see the next one. But you also received awards in London. Here is uh, Queen Elizabeth II writing to you, indicating that you have won, uh, that you have been, you are going to be given this award and here you are receiving the award from Her Majesty the Queen of England and the Commonwealth. Uh, could we have the next picture? And here you are with her actually pinning the, is it the OBE that you received there um, from Her Majesty the Queen? And uh, these are wonderful pictures. Thank you for sharing them with us. And um, we are very, very happy to receive them and to show them to the world, really, and to show them to Trinidad and Tobago what you Thank have you. been able to do. Tell me something. When you got this recognition in Trinidad and Tobago, how did you feel in 2002? Well, you know, it's very interesting that uh, the 2005, it, it was very interesting in that um, it's confidential. You don't tell anybody. You get uh, invited to receive an award 
uh, for business. Uh, and I, you know, when you get told, um, rather like the, the, the award from the Queen, you're so excited to tell everybody. But it, it was it's so unusual to be recognized because I do what I do to the best of my ability. I share my knowledge um, and experience onto others. But we don't do it for awards. We just do what we do. We want to do it well. And uh, to be recognized by others, is, it was a great surprise initially um, and, uh, and very, very humbling. And humbling is a word that's used so often, but I, I do really mean it. It was very, very humbling. So in, immediately I told my godfather, my godfather was, um, bless his soul, Stephen C. Passard. I told him first. I told, no, I told my mother first, and then I told my godfather. And um, they said, well, how do you know? Because, you know, you're not meant to know this. It's, yeah. it's announced, but you're not meant to know this. But I said I was uh, confidentially told that if I would come to Trinidad um, to receive this award, then I've got to make some plans. So it was unusual that I was told in advance. But very, very pleased to, to, to be recognized in this, this way. And, and who did you tell when you got the communication from uh, Buckingham Palace? Well, that was really, really interesting. Well, what is, what is very interesting about that is that I got a letter from the, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And I, um, but you've got to be a British citizen. And you've got to give so much information about yourself. Uh, but I responded. I didn't actually uh, refuse it or turn it down, but I said I would like the award. I would like to receive the award as a, a national of Trinidad and Tobago and not Britain. I'm proud of my background. I'm proud of where I came from. I'm proud of Tunapuna. I'm proud of Trinidad. And I wanted to receive the award. Uh, if you were to award me, uh, I would like it to be um, as a Trinidad citizen. This is, I didn't realize that I threw a span into works. Yes because uh, the Trinidad is a republic yes. and the queen is not head of state. We've That's got a president. Right. That is correct. And uh, this is very unusual. And they do not award anyone uh, that is not a British citizen or dependent territories. Yes. And so uh, I didn't hear anything again. And I thought, well, that was that. And, you know, I didn't mind because I, you know, my the pride in my country came first. Uh, but then, uh, one minute after midnight, the New Year's Honours List is announced. And my name was on the list. But prior to that, they had to get permission from the Trinidad and Tobago government to award me. And so I had a, a telephone call from the Prime Minister at the time. And he said to, to me, he said, Andrew, no, no. He said, Sir Andrew, I've got something to tell you, but it's confidential. And I thought, well, if it's confidential, why are you telling me? But he was so excited. Uh, Mr. Manning was so excited was to tell me that time, I was going to yes. be awarded that, um, that he couldn't keep it to himself either. Yes. And uh, yes, so uh, he gave the approval. Um, and the president of Trinidad and Tobago gave approval. And I was awarded by the Queen. OK, that is a, uh, the, 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 award I, the, the award I might add is, is the most excellent order of the, an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Yes, OK, yes, OK. Um, so uh, is this the first time you are telling this story publicly? This is the first time I'm telling it. Well, I'm glad you broke the story here on <laughs> MCTV, Multicultural TV and 97.5, U97.5 FM radio. Uh, thank you very much for talking with me on that. I wonder, I want to ask you something though um, about COVID. How has COVID affected you personally, and how has it affected your business during this time? Very, very good question, Bo. Thanks. Thank you for that question because this is um, uh, Google has chosen me to promote. Um, how we do business. At the beginning of the show, you yes. Oh, you did? All right. Yes, I, I mentioned I that you were one of five people chosen by Google to show yes. the world what yep. small business had been doing during the time of COVID to survive. Absolutely. Ah, there you are. So the, um, what I have been, how it's affected me personally, it's not affected me at all. I, I'm in very good health. My family is in very good health. So personally, I've not been affected. As business had been closed in the United Kingdom for the best part of a year, uh, there's been very little or no business. 
uh, there, but uh, the government has chipped in to pay the, the salaries of all the staff, so there's no problem there. Uh, the landlords has given us uh, nine months rent free, so there's no uh, problem there. So we've been uh, paying just three months of rent in the first nine months. The government's also give us a zero rate of business rates, so we've not been paying uh, business rates at all, um, which is, you know, in your money is a, a million dollars a year, and the rent is nearly $2 million a year. So, you know, it's, it's quite a lot. Uh, and to have that down to zero is very attractive. Uh, but what I had been doing in the interim, I converted uh, 1,800 square feet of space here in Tudopuna, and we'd been making the suits here in Trinidad uh, for export. And so uh, what we've been doing is actually finding new ways. If we weren't allowed to work in the United Kingdom, uh, we've been working here in Trinidad yeah. and uh, creating clothing literally it, it, downstairs where I live yeah. uh, in, in Tudopuna. And so it gave me an opportunity to develop a high quality bespoke tailoring business here in Trinidad. This is based um, simply on uh, measurements uh, taken and basically on the online and having all of this information in front of you and then doing the suits here on the basis of the information you have without actually measuring the person. Is that correct? Without actually face-to-face -face meeting the person. Yes. With what, what is really exciting about this new way of doing business, uh, Bo, if I may say, call you Bo. Um, sure. That, my, my name is Bo, and I call the show Good Morning. Uh, uh, morning. Um, I call the show um, Brighter Morning. Brighter with Morning Bo. with Bo. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Well, yes, what is interesting about, um, about this opportunity here is that I, I've made a video on how to take, professionally take measurements. And so I would send that video out to customers and prospective customers, and I would do a live video call and look at someone else taking the measurements. I would literally write the measurements down, then we'll cut the pattern and prepare a fitting and courier that fitting to the customer. And then we'll go through the same process, we'll do a video call and actually do the video call while I'm sitting right where I am here in Trinidad and the fitting is being done by someone who is not knowledgeable or experienced, but they're working with my guidance. They'll do the fitting and then it'll be couriered back to me here in Trinidad and I would complete the suit and then courier it back out to the okay. customer. That's how been working people, very... How, how many people are supporting you in this enterprise? How many people are working with oh. you? Oh, uh, uh, there are very few people because they're not allowed here to, to, to come out and, um, and, and work. work. With you. So I, I, there are three of us. My wife is a master tailor, myself, and one other person that's actually helping this process All around. Right. But do you intend to build this in business in Trinidad? Because I know you were teaching at one point at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And I know at the MIC you had also done some programs uh, to help to train people in Trinidad and Tobago. Do you think that we can have an industry here? Um, uh, I mean, with you playing on a kind of anchoring and guidance role and building an industry such as you have built in London and other places here in Trinidad and Tobago that is global in scope using the online system? My ambition is to continue to build what I've been working at here for the last three years, to build Trinidad and Tobago to become recognizable as the center of excellence in sartorial art and bespoke tailoring in, in design. That is very, very important to me. You know, my umbilical cord is, is buried here in Tunapuna. I know you, and you, I am you're very, very, very nationalistic connected. in feeling, I can tell. And I've interacted very, with you before, so I'm aware of that, yes. I'm very, very connected to my home. And it is very important that I continue. I, I actually say, to my customers, made in Trinidad, made in TNT, the benchmark of bespoke quality. That's my tagline. And and you have that on your suits. Yes, yes. You, you put that on your suits. So when you I, are, absolutely. You are branding Trinidad and Tobago as a place of high quality tailoring. Yes. In fact, I'm doing a media launch in Washington D.C. on Monday, the 26th of July. 
promoting Trinidad and Tobago. And I have been doing that for the last several years uh, as a build-up. So on, on, uh, I'm doing one in New York on the 22nd, that's uh, on Thursday, and I'm doing another in Washington, D.C. on the 26th. All right, very good. If you don't mind, uh, I would like to invite you to come on another time where we can pursue that angle of the discussion. And I'll be grateful if you can come on. And I want to ask you uh, a question which, which um, I, I don't know how you're going to answer it, but I think it's important to answer it. You deal in high fashion, and you deal in people who are of really relatively high net worth who pay a lot of money for the suits that you make. How do you justify that who to someone who indicates that look you only sew for the rich you only look after the rich you really don't care what happens to ordinary people in the society how do you speak to that issue well let me first of all say it's not high fashion yes. it is style and elegance fashion is a moving target fashion is designed to discredit what you have in your wardrobe so you can go out and buy something new but whereas style is everlasting uh, and, and elegance outlasts, outlasts fashion. Elegance is an expression of individuality. Uh, the rich and famous, uh, that's, that's another question. No, nothing is expensive. It's expensive if you can't afford it. Uh, so it's relative, expense is relative. Uh, those who aspire to dress well uh, are similar to those who aspire to, to, to drive certain cars or to have certain homes in certain areas or have certain kinds of holidays. You know, there is a, there is a marketplace for everything and every, uh, everyone. We, when it comes to uh, addressing those who are, are not afford, well, find what we do uh, to be expensive or unaffordable, we, I actually train, and I have trained probably in excess of a thousand tailors throughout the world. I lived and worked in India. I trained tailors in India. I, I trained 39 companies in India. I lived and worked there. I've lived and, and worked in Sri Lanka. And I've gone to different parts of the world in, in Middle Asia. I've taught there. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time sharing the knowledge and experience onto others. So they can then go on to offer their services at whatever the price point may be in their own countries. And of course, Trinidad and Tobago have done the same here. I started with 35 students here, teaching them the skills of a, a world-class master tailor. It is now up to them to be entrepreneurial and to yes. go on and offer their services onto others. And they can offer to uh, you know, you, you, Yeah, you wouldn't ask uh, Brian Lara to come and play club cricket, win ball cricket. You, wouldn't, you might ask him, but he probably wouldn't. Or you wouldn't ask Usain, Usain Bolt to come and run in your school. But what he would do, he would train others. To, to, to get to that level. And Brian Lara will train others to actually reach out to others. So what I'm doing here is actually sharing knowledge and experience onto others so they can then reach out to those who find coming to, to Maurice Sedwell or coming to Andrew Ramroop uh, is uh, unaffordable. But I often say is you can't not to. Well, I want to thank you for conversing with me this morning. I must say that in conversation, you have your own elegant style. And I want to commend you on that. And um, you, you, uh, you, do, you do have a presence, and I think that would be very important for your business and the kind of business that you do. But I thank you for what you, you are doing for Trinidad and Tobago. As I said, I'd like to talk to you about that again to see how we can build an industry here that could employ fairly large numbers of people with an external market, that's to say a global market and how that business can be developed here. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew Ramroop of, of uh, Maurice Sedwell, uh, tailoring in London and marketing his products and his skill and his talent uh, to countries and people all over the world. Thank you for watching, viewers. This is Brighter Morning with Mo, and we now hand over to Chanel for the news. Thank you.